it is indeed a small world. You heard uh, some good advice. I don't think anyone had to already tell you to be a badass. I think some of you probably figured that out a while back. There is no greater joy than to teach, truly, unless it is to do, but that's redundant. And uh, the, uh, the fact that, uh, that Colonel Harvey was with Oscar Mayer, I thought I was going to fall off my own chair. I got out of the service in 1969 as a Russian linguist. Uh, who hires Russian linguists? It was the only people who hired Russian linguists were the people I was already working for, and they wanted to put me behind a desk, and I don't do desks. I was selling soap door to door, and a guy hired me right at the door to go to work for Oscar Mayer right here in Washington, D.C., 1969. Amazing how life makes a twist and turn, and you try and connect the dots. It's also interesting along that line to know that, that pretty much most of you by far, the majority of you will end up doing something that has not yet been invented. How do you prepare for that? How do you prepare, how does the teacher prepare you? How do you prepare to do something that has not yet been invented? And there's only one way. Learn all you can about all you can. We are indeed, and again, fortunate to see stars today, lots of them. Four of them across each shoulder. We are privileged to have General John Allen, United States Marine Corps, retired. General Allen, a four-star general, former commander of NATO International Security Assistance Force and U.S. forces in Afghanistan. So it is indeed my great pleasure to introduce to you General John R. Allen, United States Marine Corps. Didn't have to work at all. I got an ambush in this morning already. Uh, Cadet Karen Kim was going to introduce me. I think we've, uh, we've got all the introduction out of the way we need to. It's really an honor to be with you this morning. Uh, it's incredibly humbling to come in behind a couple of Tuskegee airmen, uh, where the training highlight of the morning was the advice, uh, be a badass. I'm not sure how you do better than that. Let me just tell you a little bit about what I want to talk about this morning. We'll go to Q&A as quickly as we can. Sadly, we don't have as much time as I would like to have uh, with, with this group. Um, we're going to talk about two major points this morning. One is uh, your oath of office. This is a moment uh, where our Constitution is constantly in people's uh, minds. Uh, it's an issue that it's being debated, what the intent of our framers was. But there was no doubt about where the Constitution fits in the context of the oath of office of those of you all who will lead our troops in combat. And then the second thing is, speaking about the oath of office, how does that affect and what should it, uh, how should it uh, be interpreted with respect to the meaning of your commission? So we're going to talk about that. Uh, a little background on my family since we've been talking about history here. Uh, my family uh, has origins in the Army, Navy, and in the Marine Corps. Uh, my grandfather was an Army combat engineer who was uh, badly gassed in the First World War on the Western Front. My father uh, enlisted in the Navy <clears throat> in 1939, was assigned to a destroyer, which was torpedoed by a German U-boat before World War II started, actually, in October of, uh, of 1941. He would fight throughout the entire war across the, Medi uh, the, the uh, North Atlantic, the Mediterranean, transferred to the Pacific. Uh, and would end up, uh, at the end of that war, uh, anchored just, to, just away from the USS Missouri uh, and would be a witness to the surrender of the Japanese. The Marine Corps side of my family uh, fought in World War I, uh, fought at the battles of Guam and Guadalcanal, fought at the battles of Saipan, Tinian, and Iwo Jima and Okinawa. Uh, I came into service when I was 17, would go into the Naval Academy. For those of you from West Point, that's Brand X. Uh, graduated as an infantryman, spent uh, 38 years as an infantry officer, uh, would serve in uh, Bosnia and in Afghanistan in, and in Iraq, and then later would, uh, at, the, at the request of President Obama, help to organize and then lead the global coalition against the Islamic State. So it's an opportunity uh, this morning when we go to q and I'd be very happy to answer your questions, however you want to frame them about service in the military, service in combat, 
uh, what our higher moral obligations are, regardless of the uniform you wear, regardless of the formation you lead, because I think it's extraordinarily important for us to have this conversation. Um, 24 years ago, almost to this day, three levels up in this building, I was uh, going through the public gallery with my family. I'd been in command of a Marine Battalion landing team for some period of time. We'd been working up through a special operations program, and we were about to deploy to the Mediterranean, almost certainly going to end up in Bosnia. And I, my business in particular, beyond commanding the 1,200 Marines of the Battalion landing team, was to be the rescue force commander. And the organization that I was leading that was going to go into the Adriatic to, to rescue downed pilots flying over Bosnia was to alternate with the SEAL teams coming out of San Vito in Italy, and we were aboard the USS Wasp. So I brought my family up for the last several days before we would deploy. I'm from this area originally. And three levels up, I'm having the opportunity to go through the public gallery. And if you've not been through it, you got to go through it. And I want to tell you why. Because on display there was an original copy of the Constitution. And to that point, you know, over 20 years of my life, from the moment my father swore me in, in 1971, he'd been an officer in the Navy, as I described, from that moment until the time I put my eyeballs on the original copy of the Constitution, I'd never seen it. But for years, I had sworn a sacred oath to support and defend the Constitution. For years, I and my Marines, and I would eventually command joint forces, I and all the services who would arrive in combat in several different theaters, we had sworn an oath to support and defend the Constitution. You know, the United States is not a place, although we can find ourselves on a map. It's not about a piece of fabric, although we do salute a flag. It's not about a person, although we acknowledge leaders, key leaders, both in our history and in the present day. The United States is about a set of ideas, principles, principles as enshrined in the Constitution of the United States. And our framers intended that the sacred dimension of the Constitution define us as a people, and define us as a nation. And for that reason, from almost the very earliest moments of the Republic, our military, unique in the world, and I've commanded a 50-nation coalition in Afghanistan, and I led a 65-nation coalition against the Islamic State. I know what I'm talking about. We are unique in the world in that we owe our ultimate loyalty, those of you in uniform, and I spent a little time in that garb, our loyalty is to the principles of the Constitution, our humanity, commitment to human rights, the freedom of speech, the Bill of Rights, which enshrine human rights across the board. Now, when you entered your program, you swore an oath. When you graduate and receive your commission, you'll swear an oath. As you're promoted each time, you'll swear that oath over and over and over again, and you're going to administer that oath over and over and over again. So I want to take a minute and talk about it this morning. Because right now the Constitution is being tested and pulled and twisted in a whole bunch of ways in the public domain. But the reality is, of course, it is what the fundamental principles of our republic rest upon at any given moment. So when you swear that oath the day you graduate, you're going to be asked to raise your right hand. <clears throat> You'll probably be asked by the person who's administering the oath, you, are you prepared to swear this oath before God? That's your choice. That's one of the great things about America. And you can swear it before God or you can affirm it based on your own personal predilections. But it goes something like this. I do solemnly swear, solemnly swear, that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and of, of America against all enemies, all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely, an obligation. Nobody's making you do this. You take this obligation freely, without 
mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that you will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office upon which you are about to enter, so help you God. Now, they're not kidding when they ask you to swear this oath, and I see some commissioned officers who've been spending some time uh, in uniform. Those of you who served in combat, those of you who've seen the ramp ceremonies, whether it's in Iraq or in Afghanistan, you know that the awful reality of what we do, unique in the society of the United States as officers of our military services, the awful reality of what we do in the world as the leading proponent of democracy and the community of nations, is that the outcome of our duties may be the sacrifice of our lives and the sacrifice of those we lead. So as you think about this, and I really beg you to think about your oath of office, take a moment and study the words. Take a moment and think about the origins. Why did the framers, why in their brilliance, did they place the United States military's loyalty in the end to our Constitution? It was to preserve the rights of our citizens. And importantly, that military is civilian controlled. So that there will never be a coup in this country the way there is in almost every other country at some point in its history. We will always be loyal to the principles of the Republic because you have sworn an oath to this Constitution. But let's talk about the meaning of your commission. There is a book which I would recommend if you don't have it, you ought to get it. Uh, I know it was rewritten recently, updated. It's called The Armed Forces Officer. It was written in 1950. And in the original version of it, and you can still get it online if you search a little bit, you wanna, if you can get it, you want to get an original version. 1950. We're just a few years after World War II, the greatest conflagration the planet has ever seen. Well more than 50 million dead. The North Koreans invade South Korea. It appears that both Stalin and the Chinese have lined up behind the North Korean invasion. And the concern, of course, was at the end of World War II, when we saw the Iron Curtain descend upon Europe, and we saw China, mainland China, go down to Mao Zedong, and the Republican forces flee across the Taiwan Strait under Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, it really looked as though this was the ultimate standoff between the, the uh, elements of freedom and the elements of communism. And we weren't sure how this was going to end up. And in 1950, when the North Koreans invaded, we did not do well. If you've read the history, you know about Task Force Smith and some of the other organizations. It was not clear that we would be able to keep the Korean invaders from completely running our forces off the South Korean peninsula. Desperate moment. U.S. Army and Marines are fighting in desperate conditions to try to hold on. Meanwhile, around the world where we were faced off against communist or Soviet forces, we thought this might be the opening shot of the big final conflagration, because all sides now were armed with thermonuclear weapons. So this was a pretty bad moment. And we were now a joint force. In 47, we had become, in essence, a joint force in many respects, even though we were still fighting as services. But we needed to talk to the armed forces officer about why that individual should be leading our troops in combat. Because if this goes south on us, every dimension of our military will be committed into this war. And we were not doing well, frankly. It was not certain how this would unfold. 
So the army commissioned one of its greatest historians to put together a book called The Armed Forces Officer. And that historian's name does not appear in the original book. Can't find it in there. But you will know if you study why there was a manual, if you will, a pamphlet, as the Army called it, on the Armed Forces Officer, Army PAM 600-1, you find out that a fellow by the name of S.L.A. Marshall wrote the book. Also, for historians, he's known as SLAM. And what SLAM attempted to do was to put in context our service. Because if you're an officer of the armed forces, you have sworn that oath. You're prepared to go forth and do battle on behalf of the United States to protect the Constitution and to pay the ultimate price in doing it. And SLAM, and I'm going to read you a couple of excerpts out of this because I think it's important. And just remember when it was written, 1950. SLAM says, other than the officer corps, there is no group within our society which the obligation of the nation is more fully expressed. Even so, other Americans regard this fact with pride rather than envy. They accept the principle that some unusual advantage should attend exceptional and unremitting responsibility. We read that sentence again. They accept the principle that some unusual advantage should attend exceptional and unremitting responsibility. Whatever path an American officer may walk, that officer enjoys prestige, though little is known of that individual's intrinsic merit, he will receive the respect of fellow citizens unless that individual proves to be utterly undeserving. Now there's a phrase in this that I think is really important. This is why you have to read this book from my perspective. Americans accept the principle that unusual, some unusual advantage should accrue to individuals who demonstrate exceptional and unremitting responsibility. And what does that mean? This is what sets you apart as officers of your services. <clears throat> Exceptional responsibility. You uniquely in the American society will lead men and women, characteristic of your service, you will lead them in combat. And you may have to make decisions. And again, for those of you who have served in combat, you will know how awful and how difficult those decisions are to give the orders which may send one of your troops to her death or his death. That is exceptional, exceptional in the entire spectrum of our society. No one else has that responsibility. But it's also unremitting. It is unremitting because there's no let up. You're not just on duty for eight hours a day, doing exceptional things, and then you're off duty. It is unremitting. You bear the burden because you've chosen to serve, because you swore an oath, because you've accepted a commission. You have chosen to bear the burden of that exceptional responsibility 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I'm going to tell you, it's hard for you now in school, in combat, it's a burden you will never fully understand until you've had to bear it. So why is this important to understand? Because as a republic that is committed to a set of principles, a set of principles that really defines our humanity as a people and as a great nation, what's important to understand is that if we are going to fight, if we are going to lead our troops in combat, you officers, we officers, have to lead them from the front in all things. How we organize our lives, how we live our lives, how we conduct our leadership. Lead from the front in all things because you, here's the point, you must possess the moral authority to send your troops forward in combat, either to take life or potentially to sacrifice their own. 
That's exceptional responsibility. And it is unremitting. It is never off your shoulders. And when your hand comes down out of the air and you have said, so help me God, having sworn to give everything about you to the defense of our Constitution and through that defense, our people, this is an awesome responsibility that you're about to shoulder. And for those of you who are commissioned, those of you who served in combat, you know what I'm talking about. So this is the meaning of your commission. This is why it's essential that you understand at the very DNA of what we do as a military in this great nation, how we serve and our responsibilities in our service. And I'll just add one other thing from the book. Again, I recommend you get it. And this is what's so interesting, I think. SLA Marshall would go on to read that the trust imposed in the highest military commander in the land is not more than that in charge to the newest ensign or second lieutenant, nor is it less. It is the fact of the commission which gives special distinction to that man or woman and in turn requires that the measure of the devotion to the service of the country be distinctive as compared with the charge laid upon an average citizen. It's a little bit hard to work your way through, but in essence, SLA Marshall's point is, it doesn't make any difference how senior you become. The fact that our nation has bestowed upon you the humbling responsibility of leading our troops in combat and defending our Constitution, it is no different a responsibility except in scope and magnitude for a second lieutenant than it is for a general. And to prove the point, I have my second lieutenant commission at home from when I was commissioned on the 2nd of June, 1976. And on the wall in my home, I have my four-star general commission. And while one was printed off a printer, and I think my first sergeant misspelled my name when he wrote it in, the other looks like a work of art, but here's the difference. There is no, here's the, the point. There is no difference in the words. It reposes special trust and confidence in the fidelity and integrity of the recipient. And it is the same expectation of a second lieutenant, in this case, ensigns and lieutenants elsewhere. It's the same expectation by the nation of the young officer as it is for the four-star general commanding a theater of war. This is why we're so unique as a people. This is why our country's been so unique in the entire history of humankind. Because rather than swear an oath to a king, or to a symbol, or to a flag, or to some piece of terrain, we, you, have sworn an oath to a set of principles enshrined in the Constitution of the United States, and you need to understand that. So again, three levels up, I'm standing there reading the Constitution, I can hardly stand it. Because in all the time I've led Marines around the world, I'm about to go out again, and would in fact be on the ground leading the first Marines to go into Sarajevo as the, at the end of the Bosnian War. I'd never laid eyes on that document. And so I strongly recommend that you take some time and think about your oath of office. It's not just a ceremony. It is the commitment of your very life in the end to what we're all about. And when you put the remains of your troops onto those aircraft to send them home, I hope to God that you have lived up to the right in the manner to have given the orders that resulted in that moment. I had 561 troops killed under my command in Afghanistan, <clears throat> which was letters to all the families and to the children, 5,400 wounded, many of them, of course, amputees, and then the unseen wounds of those who would go home and never be the same. I don't pass a day without think, thinking about some of those troops. 
whether it was in Iraq or in Afghanistan. And I hope you will not pass a day now without thinking about that responsibility as you face it for the future. This is my final point, which makes us unique as a people in the world. There are lots of folks who join the military because they have a desire to kill or they have business interests. And I'm not talking about the United States. I'm talking about elsewhere. You'll serve alongside them. You'll probably fight them. What makes us unique isn't that we have joined to kill because we have joined and are prepared to die for something bigger than ourselves, for something that is unseen, a set of principles enshrined in our Constitution. So I'm really glad to be with you this morning. And I am, I'm humbled still at having had the opportunity to serve in our joint forces and in the Marine Corps. And I hope as you prepare yourselves in the final days of your commissioning programs that you'll give very serious thought about what it is that is that exceptional and unremitting responsibility. So let me stop there. I think we've got about 15 minutes for questions, and, uh, and then we'll go from here. Yes, sir. What program are you in? I go to the Academy. Okay. Um, you mentioned the relentless burdens that an officer faces, especially the face of combat. And I'm wondering, in your experience, what did you reply to, or what did you rely on to help you? Sure. That sure. Everybody hear the question? Um, several things. I had I had officer mentors, and I had enlisted mentors. First, my father was one of the greatest officers I ever knew because he truly lived uh, by an example for me every day. Uh, having served in combat in world, across all of World War II in the Navy, some of the hardest fighting, and having served in Korea as well, he truly understood what it was like to lead from the front, and he was that example for me. But there were Marine officers as well. Uh, I'll make a couple other points. But there were non-commissioned officers who were incredible examples for me. And I never miss the opportunity to talk about the first, first sergeant of the organization, first rifle company I commanded, Fox Company, 2nd Battalion, 8th Marine. I was very fortunate. I uh, had the opportunity to command a rifle company deployed as a raid company with the 6th Fleet as a lieutenant. Very fortunate. But 1st Sergeant Ritchie was my first sergeant. 1st Sergeant Ritchie walked out of the hills of West Virginia to use a phone for the first time to call a recruiter to enlist in the Marine Corps. And he would fight in Vietnam in an organization some of you who sought, fought in Vietnam know it to be Bravo Company, 1st Battalion, 9th Marines. Bravo 1-9, also known as the Walking Dead. And that part of the Marine Corps fought in the Quang Tri province of Vietnam against the finest infantry we ever fought against, which was the North Vietnamese regular. He was one of 12 Marines to survive one night after a company was surrounded, and one of four NCOs to survive in another night. And Donnie W. Ritchie taught me how to be an officer in ways that no one else could. He taught me what, an expect, what the expectations were of the Marines, of the officers, and you know, it wasn't any different than anything I just said to you. But he said it to me like a drill instructor, he said it to me like a seasoned combat veteran, and I remember being in a fight in the hole with him one morning. Sky is reddening up, and he was really quiet. And he said to me, sir, you don't know what the dawn means to me, because night after night in Vietnam, if we saw the dawn, we knew we'd live to see another day. You can't pay for that kind of experience. It doesn't come to you from the Naval Academy. It doesn't come from leadership class. Listen to your NCOs, whether they're petty officers or whether they're NCOs. They are going to be of enormous importance to you, but get a mentor. Now, the next thing I will tell you is you've got to be a reader of history. You're way too young to rely solely on your own instincts to be successful in combat. You've got to read history. You know, the entire sweep of the experience of commanders in battle 
is, lay at, is laid at your feet. You don't even have to go to a library anymore. It's all online, for God's sake. It's wonderful. And you have to read what other officers in the, in the areas in which you will serve, you've got to read what they went through. Because you're going to be walking in their footsteps. You don't want to discover this new for the first time. Read history. And I always have said to my students, there isn't a thing you can do about having a 22-year-old body. But if you're dedicated to the profession of arms, there's no excuse for not having a 5,000-year-old mind. Just think about that for a second. And then finally, read biographies. Read biographies. Why did some of our great leaders become great? It was the formative moments of their contact with mentors early in their lives. Read the biographies. In the Navy, we've got wonderful biographies on one of my greatest and favorite sailors, uh, Race Bruins. You know, the quiet warrior, as he was called. He was one of the greatest commanders the United States ever produced in any uniform. Yet he was completely unassuming. He was one of the most humble leaders we've ever had. And he believed himself to be a servant of the sailors that he led. The humble servant. If anyone, anyone ever accuses you of being a humble servant as an officer, you ought to put your hand up and say, guilty as charged. Because that's a pretty good set of circumstances to live in. So get yourself a couple of good mentors. Read the history of warfare and read biographies. That's the only way that you can get ready. Otherwise, if you're experiencing this for the first time in combat, it is way too late. It is way too late. Does that answer your question? Thank you very much, sir. My pleasure. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, my name is Midshipman Chris Brakey. I'm from the Naval Academy. Um, sir, you mentioned early on the application of the Bill of Rights and that it applies to protecting the rights of people across the world. Uh, you'll forgive me for bringing up the elephant in the room, but given the recent events in Syria with withdrawal of troops, how do you quantify the extent of that principle? Well, I, I don't know if you've been watching the news, uh, but I was on the news a good bit expressing my view on it with Christian Amanpour and CNN, et cetera. I think it's a collapse of American policy, frankly. Since many of those Kurdish fighters were fighting because of the work that we did early along in the coalition, um, and I hate to see that you all have to witness this. Uh, but in the end, the decisions that have been made uh, have been made at the expense of the Kurds. You know, the United States pursued a series of decisions years ago that uh, I think were the correct decisions, both in the Obama administration and in this administration, which is let's do all we can to empower the indigenous fighting forces to be what are known as the defeat mechanisms of the enemy. Let's not do it ourselves. We can if we have to, and we're actually quite good at it. But let's have the indigenous force be the defeat mechanism. And, and I, when I took over the coalition and we were trying desperately to stop the onslaught of the Islamic State, which was headed towards Baghdad, President Obama sent me to Ankara in Turkey to try to find a way to begin to take the war to the Islamic State in Syria. We had no options. The entire border along the Syrian border was in the hands of the Islamic State. We had no options. <clears throat> and then the Islamic State intended to wipe out the entire population of a small town south of the border called Kobani. And the Kobani was uh, occupied by Syrian Kurds. And this is really interesting. Half the fighting force were women. And they were awesome. And the Islamic State was desperately afraid of getting up close to them because you get killed in action. Uh, in that environment, you ain't going to paradise, I'm telling you. So when we saw that they were, in fact, able to hold their own, but they were going to be overwhelmed eventually, President Obama made the decision to pour on American firepower. Between the A-10s and the carrier-based aircraft and the F-16s now flying out of Turkey, we stopped them. We learned that point with some special forces thrown in quickly to help control supporting arms, airstrikes. We learned we now had an ally. The Kurds, they could fight, and they were ready to fight. We needed them. And so we organized, through our special operators, and eventually about 2,200 American troops, we organized the capacity for the Kurds to fight. The Kurds utterly and completely defeated the main force units of the Islamic State. Now, there's still some of those guys running around, but not an organized unit. But here's the deal. 11,000 Kurds were killed fighting those people. 
I think we had five of our troops were killed, and that's tragic. One is, one is tragic. Five is, is awful. But in the context of who was doing the fighting and the dying and the winning and the ground gaining, it was the people we empowered. And then after one phone call, we walk away from that. And the Turks come pouring across the border and start blasting our allies and their families, and 200,000 Kurds are now taken to foot. To foot. You, can't, you can't do anything about that. I can't do anything about that. The only thing we can do is follow our orders, so long as they're legal. And there will be voices that will attempt to shape policy in a way so we don't make a decision that, in essence, looks like we're being routed from the battlefield, which is what that kind of looks like. I mean, we had Russian troops occupy American battle positions within 24 hours of our special forces leaving them, running the Russian flag up over a place where the Stars and Stripes had been flying 24 hours earlier. <clears throat> so if I sound like I'm mad as hell about this, I am damn mad about it. But our great soldiers who were doing the fighting followed their orders, and they moved to the east, and they're headed into the KRG now, the Kurdish Re Regional Government in Iraq. There will come the day when you are an admiral or a general. There will come the day when you will, as I was asked to do as a four-star, give advice. And you must give what's known as best military advice. You must have the moral courage by virtue of your swearing of your oath and your commitment to your commission that if the President of the United States asks you for your advice on an issue, you give best military advice. And so long as the, the ultimate decision is not an illegal order, you have to follow your orders. And that's your lot in life until you take that uniform off. So it's a difficult moment for us right now as a, as a nation. Difficult for me because as we're pulling out of Syria, as the Turks are rolling up the Kurds, we're deploying 1,800 more troops into Saudi Arabia the day that Putin lands in Riyadh to have meetings with Mohammed bin Salman and King Salman, and then go on to visit our other Arab ally in the Gulf. It's a grand, grand strategic issue for me. So as the president of Brookings, I'm not going to give up on this. We're going to speak out loudly on it. We're going to write about it. We're going to do everything we can to support our allies. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, you're welcome. So there are some other cadets, I think, in this room. I'm, uh, I'm more than a little concerned. Uh, good morning, you're holding, sir. You're holding the thermonuclear question for last, I'm sure. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, Midshipman Third Class Dobsky, U.S. Naval Academy. Okay. Um, my question to you is you've kind of hinted to it uh, this morning in your talks. Uh, we've already touched upon the Kurdish-Syria conflict yeah. uh, and the kind of falling apart of our constitutional foundations. Uh, what future or what conflicts... Um, among the list of the ones that the U.S. is facing currently, do you foresee uh, posing the greatest challenges to us as uh, yep. young junior officers in the future? Um, it's, <clears throat> it's a multifaceted answer, frankly. Uh, we are going to continue to see uh, instability in, in a number of states around the world where the demography is trending in a negative way, where weak governance is unable to respond to the aspirations of its people where the population is getting larger and younger all the time, and their tolerance for the corruption typically in the capital will be less and less over time. So we are going to have to continue to fight if we want to preserve the sanctity of some of these countries. We're going to have to continue to be involved in counterterrorism operations as a component probably of counterinsurgency. But we also now have a very virulently dangerous Russia that we have to deal with. They're pressuring the entire eastern frontier of NATO in a number of ways. And we could, that's a whole other day of conversation. And then for the first time, we have the emergence of a peer state uh, of China. Uh, I don't wake up every morning thinking we're going to have to go to war with China. I think Graham Allison, in his great book, uh, I don't recall exactly the name, but he talks about the Thucydides trap and how a status quo power like us is going to ultimately be confronted by a rising power, China. I think it's possible that we can find a way forward with the Chinese, but they are putting hundreds of billions of dollars into advanced technology. And so you're going to have to be able to fight at the lowest level, 
to preserve the stability of some of the states. We can't afford to go over the edge. We're going to have to deal with renegade uh, sovereign states like Iran and North Korea. We're going to have to deal with the Russians in their uh, multifaceted hybrid warfare that has reached straight into the United States and had a potential uh, outcome in the 2016 election, and they're still pushing on our dem democratic processes. We may have to deal with, the, with China in many ways at a high technology level. And we could find ourselves fighting in space, and we are in battle right now in the cyber domain. Uh, and then finally, I spend a lot of time on this, in the, in the world of uh, artificial intelligence and emerging technologies and supercomputing, get ready for a form of warfare known as hyperwar, where with autonomous systems starting to come online for intelligence collection and analysis and command and control, and then potentially, although we firewalled it now until we figure it out, lethal autonomous systems, we could be fighting at speeds we can't even begin to imagine, where when I wanted to move a division on the ground in Afghanistan, it took me several days to position the armor and the, the uh, artillery, the rocket artillery, gun artillery. It took me days to get the physical forces going. But in a hyperwar environment, forces are maneuvered often at the speed of light. And if you can't make the decisions and you're second in the competition for uh, primacy, you lose the war. And then finally for me, those are all challenges which I think we can handle because of you, because of all of you, because we have the finest human capital on the planet. But the challenge for me that we're going to have to face is the reality of climate change. And why does that, what, what's he talking about? Other than the fact that our, our ships are going to have to probably relocate within 50 years. But the issue for climate change is that as large segments of the population in the world are driven off their lands because of the rapid pace of desertification or their incapacity to grow crops, in large segments of the world, as water dries up, <clears throat> as large segments of what had been originally arable land becomes uh, penetrated and saltified, we've got a serious problem. As tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people begin to migrate, two million people into Europe in 2015 completely changed the political environment of that continent. Imagine what 20 million, which is a conservative number, will look like by 2070. Now, what that means is there's going to be a lot of fighting. And who do you think has the global strategic mobility capacity to intervene? So we got to think deep, what we call the deep horizon, and think about what this means in the context of the future of the US military. We also have to think at the near horizon, which is keep Al-Qaeda, and Daesh, uh, the Islamic State, keep Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State at arm's length, shore up those states that are about to collapse, and get ready if we have to to deal with Russia and China. You've got a complex world to live in, a very complex world. I just had to live with a thermonuclear Russia, so Soviet Union. I had it easy. Good question. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Hello, sir. Hello. Mr. Vim, fourth class, Otero, Naval Academy. Yes, sir. Sir, you mentioned a lot of conflicts that we'll see ourselves in the future. Now, based on your experiences in the Marine Corps and leading Joint Forces Commands, what do you think is the role of the U.S. Naval Service in defending the United States and executing its foreign policy? Thank you, sir. Um, well, I think it's going to, in many respects, it's going to be what it always has been. And you can have a seat. Uh, obviously, we have to control the global commons. Uh, we have to, in the event, and we're, I think, posturing more and more to do this in the context of uh, a rapid reinforcement of Europe. Those of you who are got gray on your head, uh, who remember the days of reforger and 10 divisions in 10 days to Europe in the event of a Soviet uh, attack, um, we're, we're going to probably see more and more emphasis on the United States getting to Europe quickly uh, to support NATO uh, in the event of uh, uh, Russian activity. So the, the Navy's going to have a blue water mission for sea control in order to preserve uh, our forces as they get to, uh, get, get to Europe. Again, dominating the global commons. Uh, depending on how future administrations go, I'm, I'm not commenting on this one, but as we see future administrations maybe make decisions about how standing forces might come home, 
from some places. I mean, there's been some rattling about pulling the army out of Korea. Uh, there have been some questions about how big and how much of us remain, needs to remain in Europe. Uh, where the Navy has always been valuable, which is the capacity to project American power, Navy and the Marine Corps, uh, I think that will continue to be a very important mission uh, as time goes on. And depending on our overseas, continued overseas posture, it could be even more important as time goes on. And then, of course, all the services, but the Navy uniquely has to dominate the cyber domain and the space domain from a maritime environment as well. Uh, so just as everything else, as I described a moment ago, it's going to be complex. Thanks for the question. And thank you all. I wish you all the very best. Thanks very much. <laughs>